السلام علیکم ناظرین میں ہوں البینہ اور آپ دیکھ رہے ہیں ہیلتھ ٹاک ناظرین انفرٹیلٹی ایک ایسا مسئلہ ہے جو کہ کسی جنڈر سے اسوسیٹڈ نہیں ہوتا مرد یا عورت کا مسئلہ نہیں ہوتا بلکہ یہ ایک ایسا مسئلہ ہے جو کہ کسی بھی جنڈر میں ہو سکتا ہے ساتھ ہی ساتھ ایک جو بہت بڑا ایشو ہے وہ آج بھی پاکستانی سوسائٹی میں وہ یہ ہے کہ جب کوئی جوڑا بے اولاد ہوتا ہے تو انفرٹیلٹی کے تانے صرف اور صرف عورت کو سننا پڑتے ہیں تو یہ آج بھی ایک مت ہے کہ اگر کسی کا بچہ نہیں ہے تو وہ سارا کا سارا جو ایشو ہے وہ عورت میں ہے سائنس نے اب یہ پروف کر دیا ہے کہ انفرٹیلٹی کے ایشوز مرد اور عورتوں دونوں میں ہوتے ہیں اب یہ ایک بہت بڑا مسئلہ نہیں ہے یہ کوئی خطرناک بیماری نہیں ہے یہ ایک کنڈیشن ہے جس کنڈیشن کو آپ کیور کر سکتے ہیں میڈیکلی بہت سارے پروسیجرز آ گئے ہیں اب میڈیکل نے ایڈوانس اپنی سائنس کی وجہ سے سائنس اور ٹیکنالوجی کی وجہ سے ڈفرینٹ پروسیجرز کو جو ہے عوام کے لیے بنایا ہے اور ان پروسیجرز سے جو ہے لوگ مستعفی ہو سکتے ہیں اور اور لوگ ان پروسیجرز کے بعد صاحب اولاد ہو سکتے ہیں آج ہم کونسیپ فرٹیلٹی سینٹر اسی لیے آئے ہیں کہ ہم جانیں کہ آخر کیا وجوہات ہوتی ہیں انفرٹائل ہونے کی اور انفرٹائل ہونے کی کنڈیشنز کو کیسے کیور کیا جا سکتا ہے کیا ٹریٹمنٹس ہوتے ہیں اس کے اور یہ پروسیجر کی کتنی لگ بھگ کتنی جو لاگت ہے کتنی لگتی ہے اس پر یہ تمام تر سوالات اور جو بہت ساری میتھس آپ کے دماغوں میں یا ذہنوں میں موجود ہیں ان کو ہم جو ہے آج کلیئر کریں گے انشاءاللہ ناظرین اس وقت ہم موجود ہیں اندر کانسیپ فرٹیلٹی سینٹر کے کانسیپ فرٹیلٹی سینٹر کی کراچی میں برانچ ہے کراچی کے علاوہ جو ہے یہ ملتان کوئٹہ اسلام آباد میں بھی ان کی برانچز ہیں بیسیکلی یہ جو سینٹر ہے فرٹیلٹی سینٹر یہ ایک آسٹریلین فرٹیلٹی سینٹر ہے وہ یہ پاکستان لے کر آئے ہیں اور ڈیفینیٹلی آسٹریلین اسٹینڈرڈز ہیں یہاں پر اور جو لوگ جیسا کہ اپنے پروگرام کے انٹروڈکشن میں میں نے بتایا کہ انفرٹیلٹی کا شکار ہیں ان کو لگتا ہے کہ خدا نخواستہ بہت بڑی بیماری ہے حالانکہ کوئی بڑی بیماری نہیں ہے صرف اور صرف ایک کنڈیشن ہے جس کو آپ کیور کر سکتے ہیں اور یہ تمام تر جو مسائل ان پر ہم آج بات کریں گے ہمارے ساتھ ڈاکٹرز موجود ہیں پینل میں میرے پاس نیشنل ڈاکٹرز بھی ہمارے ساتھ ہیں ڈاکٹر ہیں اور ساتھ ساتھ انٹرنیشنل ڈاکٹرز بھی موجود ہیں میں ان کا تعارف کراتی چلو تو میرے ساتھ موجود ہے ڈاکٹر جان کیون اور ان کے ساتھ موجود ہیں ڈاکٹر گرام تھامسن اور ان کے ساتھ موجود ہیں ڈاکٹر سعدیہ احسن پال اور ہمارے ساتھ لز بھی موجود ہیں لز ڈاکٹر گرام تھامسن اور ڈاکٹر جان کیون آرٹلی یہ تینوں ہمارے پاس پاکستان آئے ہیں پرت آسٹریلیا سے تو آغاز کرتے ہیں ہم ڈاکٹر سعدیہ احسن سے جانتے ہیں ان سے السلام علیکم آپ سب کو پروگرام میں فارملی ویلکم کرتی ہوں اینڈ گریٹنگس فرام پاکستان فرام مائی چینل اینڈ فرام می ڈاکٹر سعدیہ تھوڑا سا ہمیں بتائیں کہ یہ ورک شاپ جو بیسیکلی آرگنائز کی کانسیپ فرٹیلٹی سینٹر پاکستان نے ان کولیبریشن ود دی آسٹریلین کانسیپ فرٹیلٹی سینٹر یہ بیسیکلی اس میں کیا سارے سیشنز ہو رہے ہیں یہ بیسیکلی انفرٹیلٹی کے اوپر ہے دو دن کی کانفرنس ہے دو ہالز ہمارے چل رہے ہوں گے اور انفرٹیلٹی کے تقریباً میل اور فیمیل کے تقریباً سارے ایسپیکٹس ہم کور کر رہے ہیں انٹرنیشنل ہمارے اسپیکرز آئے ہیں ان کے علاوہ اور بھی ہیں نیشنل اسپیکرز ہیں ہمارے آئی وی ایف ایکسپرٹس جو پاکستان کے ہیں پورے پاکستان سے آ رہے ہیں تو یہ اس طرح کی آپ سمجھیں کانسیپٹ کی پہلی انٹرنیشنل کانفرنس ہے جو اتنے بڑے اسکیل پہ ہم کروا رہے ہیں تھوڑا سا فرٹیلٹی کے کانسیپٹ کو ویوز کو سمجھا دیجئے کہ فرٹیلٹی کا کیا کانسیپٹ ہے دیکھیں انفرٹیلٹی کا کانسیپٹ یہ ہے کہ اگر کوئی شادی شدہ کپل کوشش کر رہا ہے پریگنینسی کی اور اس کو سال بھر کی کوشش کے باوجود پریگنینسی نہیں ہو رہی ہے تو اس کو ہم انفرٹیلٹی کے اس میں لاتے ہیں اور اس کی انویسٹیگیشن ہونی چاہیے 
جب میں کہہ رہی ہوں سال بھر کی کوشش تو اس میں یہ بھی ہے کہ دیکھیں اکثر کپلز شادی شدہ ہیں لیکن ہزبنڈ کہیں باہر ہیں وائف ادھر ہیں تو وہ کاؤنٹ نہیں کرتا نا جب آپ ساتھ نہیں رہ رہے تو وہ انفرٹیلیٹی میں نہیں آتا ہے سملرلی اگر خاتون کی اگر خاص طور پہ عمر پینتیس سال سے زیادہ ہے تو ہم ایک سال بھی نہیں انتظار کرتے پھر ہم چھ مہینے کے تو یہ مت نہیں ہے یہ جینون بات ہے کہ فرٹیلیٹی جو ہے اس کا عمر کے ساتھ تعلق ہے بالکل ہے شوہر کی عمر بھی کاؤنٹ کرتی ہے اور وائف کی بھی تو مرد کی عمر کتنی پرٹیکولر کوئی ایج ہوتی ہے دیکھیں ایج ایس سچ نہیں ہوتی کیونکہ کافی زیادہ عمر میں بھی جا کے مردوں کے بچے ہو سکتے ہیں لیکن جیسے جیسے عمر بڑھ رہی ہوتی ہے مردوں کی بھی فرٹیلیٹی کم ہو رہی ہوتی ہے ٹھیک ہے نا تو یہ جو ریشو ہے یا ریٹ ہے یہ عورتوں میں زیادہ مسئلہ ہو سکتا ہے عمر کا اور مردوں میں عمر کے حوالے سے دونوں میں ہوتا ہے دونوں میں ہوتا ہے لیکن عورتوں کا زیادہ اس لیے ہم سیریسلی لیتے ہیں کہ آن ایوریج پاکستانی عورتیں فورٹی فائیو ٹو ففٹی فائیو کے درمیان میں مینو پوز ہو جاتا ہے اور مینو پوز اس وجہ سے ہوتا ہے کہ انڈے ختم ہو جاتے ہیں اتنا بھی یہ زیادہ ریشو ہائے ہوتا ہے فورٹی فائیو ٹو ففٹیز میں نہیں ایسا ہی ہوتا ہے پوری دنیا میں ساری عورتیں ایک ہی جیسی ہوتی ہیں تھوڑا تھوڑا ریش کا ڈیفرنس ہوتا ہے ہمارے ہاں اس عمر میں پچاس سال ایوریج ہے اس تک عورتوں کے بیسکلی مینو پوز اس لیے ہوتا ہے کہ ایگز ختم ہو جاتے ہیں جب عورت کے ایگز ہی نہیں ہوں گے تو ظاہر ہے پریگننسی کہاں سے ہوگی اس لیے عورت کی عمر بہت امپورٹنٹ ہے اور اسی لیے ہم کہتے ہیں ایک تو ہمارے ہاں لڑکیاں دیر سے شادی بھی کر رہی ہیں پروفیشنل ہو گئی ہیں پڑھ رہی ہیں جو کہ بہت اچھی بات ہے لیکن ہم یہی کہتے ہیں کہ ایک دفعہ شادی ہو جائے اور اگر آپ کی عمر تیس سال کے قریب ہے یا زیادہ ہے تو آپ کو فیملی جلدی کمپلیٹ کر لینی چاہیے اس کو ڈیلے نہیں کرنا چاہیے اچھا تو اس وقت جو اگر ہم بات کریں فرٹیلیٹی کے کانسپٹ کو لے کر تو شروع شروع میں جب یہ کئی سال پہلے جب یہ کانسپٹ آئے تھے تو بہت ساری میتھس تھیں اس میں لوگوں کے حوالے سے یہاں پہ یہ بھی کہا جاتا تھا کہ پتہ نہیں حلال طریقہ ہے یا جائز طریقہ ہے نہیں ہے کیا وہ میتھس ابھی بھی فیس کرنی پڑتی ہیں آپ کو جب پیشنٹس آتے ہیں آپ کے پاس ہاں کرنی پڑتی ہیں اس لیے کہ دیکھیں یہ بیسکلی کوئی بھی اس طرح کے جو ٹاپکس ہیں ہمارے یہ ایک طرح کے ٹیبو سبجیکٹس ہیں زیادہ تر ان پہ بات ہی نہیں ہوتی سوسائٹی میں ٹھیک ہے گھر پہ بھی اور بہت ہی مشکل سے اس پہ ڈسکشن ہوتی ہے ہاں تو اس میں جائز نہ جائز کا کوئی ایشو ہے ہی نہیں کیونکہ پاکستان میں جب پہلا ٹیسٹیو بیبی ہوا تھا انگلینڈ میں اس کے دو تین سال بعد ہی فتوہ آ گیا تھا الازر جو سب سے ہائیسٹ سیٹ آف اسلامک لرننگ ہے وہاں سے آ گیا تھا کہ یہ حلال ہے ہو سکتا ہے از لانگ ایز شوہر کا اور بیوی کا ایگ اور سپرم استعمال ہو تو کیا یہ بھی اس طرح کچھ کچھ ایشو سرکلیٹ ہو رہے تھے اب وہ اس میں کتنی صداقت ہے کہ گاڈ نوز کہ کیا اس طرح بھی ہوا ہے کہ جو پارٹنرز ہیں ان میں سے جو آپ کا پارٹنر جو آپ کا ہسبنڈ ہے اس کی جگہ کسی اور کا جو ہے ہماری نالج میں تو نہیں ہے کہ پاکستان میں بکوز پاکستان میں الاؤڈ ہی نہیں ہے دوسرے ملکوں میں ہے بٹ ہاؤ یو میک شو کہ یہ جو ہے دونوں پارٹنرز بکوز ہمارے ہی پیشنٹس ہوتے ہیں تو ہمیں پتہ ہوتا ہے تو یہ اس کا سوال ہی نہیں ہے اور پاکستان میں نائنٹین ایٹی فور سے یہ الاؤڈ ہے ٹیسٹیو بیبی کی ٹریٹمنٹ اور اس میں کوئی مذہب کی طرف سے کوئی رکاوٹ نہیں ہے اور پہلا بیبی بھی ہمارے ہاں نائنٹین اتنا پہلے ہو چکا ہے پاکستان میں اور یہ بہت فخر کی بات ہے کہ ہم باقی مسلم ممالک کی طرح ہم نے ایک طرح سے لیڈ لی ہے اس میں پاکستان کانسپ فرٹیلیٹی سینٹر کے حوالے سے اس وقت کانسپ فرٹیلیٹی یہاں نہیں تھا کانسپ فرٹیلیٹی آسٹریلیا کی برانچ یہاں پر آئی ہے لیکن یہ کوئی نیا کانسپ نہیں ہے پاکستان کے لیے بھی پاکستان میں بھی نائنٹین ایٹی فور سے ہو رہا ہے ٹھیک ہے تھوڑا سا بات جو ہے ہم باقی مہمانوں سے بھی کرتے ہیں پھر سادی آپ کی طرف آتے ہیں ڈاکٹر جان ہاؤ ڈو یو سی لائک ڈو یو ڈو یو تھنک دیٹ کانسیپٹ فرٹیلیٹی سینٹر ہیز دا سیم اسٹینڈرڈس وچ دے ہیو ان پرتھ آسٹریلیا دے ہیو دا سیم اسٹینڈرڈس ان پاکستان از ویل یس فرام مائی ایکسپیرینس اینڈ اسپیکنگ ٹو دا سائنٹیفک ٹیم ہیئر اینڈ آلسو 
an independent scientist that's come uh, across for the conference. Um, there's every, uh, it, it absolutely adheres to the same standards that we do. It's not surprising, perhaps, we, we were very helpful in uh, setting up the clinic, how our scientific team came across and were helpful in that. And we're constantly in dialogue with each other and helping out if there are any issues. So, no, I'm very happy to say the standards are absolutely on a par with those that we have in our clinic in Perth. Okay, so you, you completely have a faith that the standards are almost, almost the same or actually the same? I would say, the, my experience, they're actually the same. Okay, great. So, uh, um, obviously, you're part of that conference. Um, what things you think that you're going to deliver to other doctors here in Pakistan or uh, things which you're going to provide to Pakistani doctors here? Um, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a plenary speaker, which means that um, I'm not necessarily presenting cutting-edge research. Um, I'm a bit too old for that now. Um, so I've been lucky enough for us to do a brief talk on the history of IVF. I've been involved in IVF now for over 30 years. And I started my work in Cambridge, which is where um, Professor Robert Edwards did his original work. Uh, so I'm presenting it on, on the brief history of IVF and then... Would you like to give us a brief uh, about what, what IVF is, what's that procedure and what, what's all that? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, IVF literally means in vitro fertilization, which means fertilization in glass. Um, it's often, as you know, known as test tube baby treatment. Um, it's been a while since we used test tubes. Um, but basically, IVF involves removing eggs from uh, the female partner and introducing them uh, in, in the laboratory in a test tube, but now a dish, um, introducing them to the sperm from the male partner, uh, keeping them in the right conditions, um, making sure that we uh, pick out the best developing embryo, uh, fertilized egg then becomes an embryo, and then putting that embryo back into the woman's uterus uh, in the hope of achieving a pregnancy. So that in a nutshell is what IVF involves. So uh, apart from IVF, which other procedure you think is really successful? Um, in terms of managing fertility in yes. general, uh, one of the most successful treatments we do is a lot simpler than IVF and it's, it's helping women who don't release eggs on a regular basis, who have ir irregular cycles. It's um, giving them medication to make them release eggs on a regular basis. And that is actually very, very successful indeed. And it's important to keep that in mind when one's assessing a couple rather than necessarily uh, racing towards IVF. Okay, great. So now moving uh, forward to Dr. Graham Thompson, we'll uh, talk to him as well. Uh, so uh, w what would you uh, say about a uh, basic concept of infertility? What's, what's that I want to hear from you? Like, uh, do you think that infertility is, is like face, uh, women face it more or it's like faced by both, both of the genders? It's not concerned with the gender. It must be stated early that infertility is a couple's problem. Not the problem of one partner or the problem of the other partner. One of the major aspects of development of fertility problems is delaying pregnancy. And that's down to the woman's age, unfortunately, but also male age is important as well. Patients, in our experience in, in Australia... But I've seen uh, uh, men having a birth, like they, they, they can give birth in 70s as well, so that shows like male's fertility. There is a, still a problem with the ageing male, and that is that there is an association with a, what's now called autism spectrum disorder, so autism in, in the offspring. The other problem with male fertility later in life is producing a new male cohort, their sons, who will also face fertility problems. Okay. So it's multifactorial, yes. Multifactorial, but still, I, uh, somehow I believe you, you guys don't want to say it, but you guys also feel that the, that infertility issue is still higher in women, if with regard to the age. Yes, for, okay. for quantity does that. Basically, a female's fertility yeah. goes along in a fairly straight line until 35 and then hits a parabola. 
And and uh, there's another question which here in pa Pakistan people uh, still believe like there's some uh, concerns like women who smoke a lot or particularly a lifestyle if if she doesn't have a lifestyle that's also going to affect her fertility is that right or just a myth? It will affect the fertility, but it will also affect the pregnancy when they they get pregnant. Okay. And so pregnancy outcome in people who have lifestyle problems uh, are lesser worse outcomes than if they don't have the, the lifestyle problems, like smoking and yeah. weight. And so, like so it does affect, you say? Yes. Okay, it does affect. Okay, so uh, it does affect. Just that Dr. Thompson bhi kehte hain ki vaakay lifestyle ka bahut zada fark padta hai aur bahut sari cheeze hain jo ki asar dalti hai fertility ke ya infertility se concern hoti hain. Guftu ko silsila yeh pe jaari rakhenge, lekin chota sa wakfa lena stay with us. वेलकम बैक आफ्टर ब्रेक नाजरीन ब्रेक से कबल हम बात कर रहे थे कुछ इनफर्टिलिटी के मसाइल के हवाले से और गुफ्तु में अब हम शामिल करते हैं अपने साथ लिस्ट को भी लिस्ट थोड़ा हमें बताएंगी कि आखिर किस तरह सारा मैनेज होता है पर ऑस्ट्रेलिया में कौन सा फर्टिलिटी सेंटर और शायद उनसे कुछ हमें और अच्छी इंसाइट्स मिल सके जो हम शेयर कर सकें अपने व्यवर्स के साथ सो लेस कमिंग टू यू आई वुड लाइक टू नो फ्राम यू लाइक वट आर द स्टैंडर्ड्स ऑफ concept fertility center uh, we are aware of the mission and vision of the organization uh, but uh, how would you define the organization itself the organization is very professional um we're there to achieve pregnancy outcomes for couples that come through the clinic um and it's a long journey for a lot of those women we do offer counseling services um as well to help them with their emotional support that they will need going through and sometimes disappointment unfortunately and and what's the ratio of the disappointment um we're looking at about 32% success rate okay for australia okay uh, so uh, coming back to uh, dr john uh, john um, there's there's a certain uh, question which i always want to ask Uh, but unfortunately i don't get a chance much to ask uh, such questions regarding health so today i have a good opportunity to ask from you uh, there's a lot of high ratio and high rate of miscarriages in pakistan these days i'm not sure whether it's across the globe but particularly looking at pakistan i would say miscarriages are very common every other girl is facing miscarriage issue the girl is perfect healthy very young even she's in her 20s but why miscarriage she's not fat she she doesn't have any any you know calories issue she's not <clears throat> overweight but why um i think um i'm not aware of any data that suggests that there's any particular population or area where the the, the background rate of miscarriage is increasing i think what is increasing is people's willingness to talk about it and be open about it and i think that's all to the good because it helps to remove some of the stigma and the emotional trauma that's associated with miscarriage I think it's important to bear in mind that as doctors we've always understood that miscarriage uh, early miscarriage affects approximately 1 in 3 pregnancies it's quite an alarmingly high rate and one of the first things that we do with a, 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 woman, a lady who's having problems with miscarriage maybe has had one or two it's actually just make that clear remove some of the um remove some of the stigma and the trauma from them because it's quite natural for people to feel that they've done something that may have caused this to happen and unfortunately the science says that when it does happen in the majority of cases the baby uh, sadly was completely malformed would be mis would be um uh, would have problems and dr john wh- why the miscarriage is uh, frequent in first trimester why frequently uh because that's the point at which the baby is laying down the the bedrock the foundations for future development so the neurological system is forming that all of the systems in a baby are formed within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy it's only after after that it's just a, it's just a period of growth so if the so the first trimester is actually very important oh a vital absolutely vital it's the time at which the blueprint for the rest of the pregnancy is completely laid down the size of the baby is probably predetermined um and as i said all the vital organs the vital structures are all formed by the end of the 12th week so if anything goes wrong there and i often and not put it uh, make the analogy towards a computer program if there's a glitch in the program the whole thing crashes and if there's a genetic problem with the baby then um, unfortunately nature steps in and says look this is this isn't going to carry on it can it can go no further 
and therefore miscarriage, I'm sorry, is, is part of reproduction, it's a natural part of life. Uh, there are factors that can influence it. Um, uh, the, the, there, are, there are many, but probably not appropriate to go into at this point. Uh, uh, Dr. John, uh, uh, for instance, if we're talking about a girl who's still in her 20s and she, she has a good lifestyle, she has no medical issues again, but back to back having miscarriages, uh, what's that again? Well, well, are as some factors associated with that? As, as I've already said, I mean, uh, the fact that one in three miscarriage, uh, one in three pregnancies end in miscarriage in the first 12 weeks, possibly a little bit less in a, in a younger person, you can relate to but that, is, that, but, it's still, but that has activated in younger persons as well. Yeah, that's, but, but that's it's still phenomenal. one in four. It's still one in four. Now, the chance of somebody having two consecutive miscarriages is still only one in 16, if you do the maths. So one in 16 is actually quite high odds. I would, I would you know, back that in a a race or a, or a lottery. <laughs> um, so it is it's, it's, it's quite common. The, the, as I said, there, are, there, there can be other factors. Um, certainly smoking does impact on the risk of miscarriage. Um, whether or not um, people are in any way related, um, even relative, in what might seem quite distance, distant relations, um, can have an impact. Um, but as I said, it's a, it's a common phenomenon. It, it's, it's sad, but it's quite common. Okay, so Dr. Graham, um, coming to you uh, regarding the C-section or cesarean operations. Here again in Pakistan, we're seeing very young ladies uh, who, who are completely fit. They also face that C-section issue. Why not a proper natural birth? Why every other girl just a C-section option? Is it because of business? Doctors have made it a business because making money or what? There's, there's more to it than that. And in fact, there will be a trend to, uh, to perhaps have even more cesarean sections than there are now because it's going to come down to the obstetrician to inform the patient that if they have a vaginal birth, a natural birth, they run the risk of pelvic floor dysfunction later and not being able to... So, no, would, would you like to repeat it again? So you saying like the uh, impacts of C-section, the worst impacts maybe you can say, are lesser than the natural birth? No, no. There are, there are two halves to this story really. Caesarean section has got its own complications associated with it. Yeah and multiple caesarean sections have got more complications associated yeah. later. Yeah. I could en enlarge on that, but I don't think it's necessary right now. But vaginal delivery is now being shown to have complications later. Okay. Uh, so that's what people are unfamiliar with that maybe. Because probably. People say uh, the natural birth is the best option, C-section is like you have, you have a whole cut off body, whole your life. Uh, and there are a lot of issues uh, like uh, there's a pain in your body, backache, severe backache. A lot of uh, women get insomniac, they have depression. These, a lot of things are associated with C-section. They cannot do, like, uh, they cannot train uh, into gym properly or maybe a lot of other things. Maybe some myths are also associated with that. I think back pain and, and features like that are common to pregnancy because pregnancy has uh, hormones associated with the soften up ligaments all over the body. Um, depression may be related to caesarean section for those patients who are hell-bent on having a vaginal delivery, but for some reason or other during the, pre the, during the delivery, things fail and they have to have a caesarean section. So there's big depression or disappointment associated with that. And the same thing can be uh, said about breastfeeding those patients that set themselves up that they must breastfeed. If they were unable to breastfeed because nature didn't deal them a good deal, then they get depressed as well. Wow, that's, so that's a connection which God has created with the breastfeeding soap that releases mother from the stress. Now there is an association, funnily enough, between caesarean section and the inability to breastfeed. Yeah, that's, that's another question. Um, and that's a question of timing. Uh, there's no easy way around that, in my opinion. Okay, so um, again, I would persist, uh, persistently ask the same yeah. question, uh, like uh, why, but still doctors think that the ultimate solution for a girl, even in her 20s, is that C-section. I'll ask the same question, John, from you as well. 
what do you believe or what's your verdict over that? But now, Thompson. Uh, I don't believe that that's the ideal thing for a 20 year old, no. I still believe that vagina delivery is a good idea despite what I said yeah. before. Uh, I don't believe in Australia anyway. But doctors here complain, they say like every girl has an issue, she cannot give a vaginal birth and so that's why we're taking her to the C-section, but why? Why are they not giving the reasons? I can't speak for Pakistan. Okay. Uh, but the concept, excuse the front pan, the, the idea... But how do you see in Australia, like what's the ratio over there of the natural birth versus the uh, C-section? I don't know the, the current figures, but I believe the last figures I saw was that it's supposed to be the, the norm for 25% cesarean section rate. But there are... So 25% was in uh, the C-section? Yeah. Okay. As opposed to 75% vaginal delivery. Okay. But there are places where your cesarean section rate is a lot higher than that. And it is true that in the private practice world, it's higher than in the public system. Yeah, that's, a, that's again. But there's again another thing. Uh, I'm particularly only talking about urban areas, not rural. In rural, we have more natural births. Yep. So again, it seems like maybe it's made a commercial thing or what? It, it's a question mark in people's mind. In Brazil, the cesarean section rate is very high, and that's because of maternal request. Uh, okay. Because the, the female population there believe that if they have a vagina delivery, their bodies will be destroyed forever. And there are cesarean section rates in Brazil that are approaching 99%. But what do you believe? Well, a body uh, get, get more destroyed with which sort of birth? I, 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 despite what I said before, I still believe that vagina delivery is a good idea. If it works well and, and for, the, for, the, for the woman, it's, it's an ideal situation. Pregnancy in itself will produce some pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, vaginal delivery will magnify that a bit. And I think I'm talking myself into a hole. But I still believe that vaginal delivery is a good idea. I do believe that somewhere around a 33% cesarean section rate is probably, or it should be, what we, do, what we aim at. Okay, Liz, uh, so as you said that you guys uh, deal with a uh, patient, you, you uh, actually uh, deal with them emotionally as well. So uh, when patient comes to you, uh, are they hopeless that they're infertile or they don't have kids? Uh, do you guys console them, you guys consult them and then you make, make them agree that this is the option, you'll uh, have, a, have a baby. So what's that process and how do you do that? Well, when we're talking to the patients, we recommend they see our counsellor because they've already been through some trauma or they might get some bad news in regards to their blood results, their sperm result, um, and they need ways to be able to deal with that. Um, a lot of people tell their family and their friends, um, and so their family and their friends are asking them questions all the time about... To so this happens abroad as well? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Most definitely. So they constantly want to know the outcome, is it working, what's happening. Um, as time goes on, people tend not to tell their family or friends because they need to be able to process some of that emotion themselves before somebody rings them up straight away and goes, oh, did it work for you? Um, and they want to be able to just process it so they can get their own answer to know how to deal for it. If it works, then that's excitement. But if it doesn't work, then it can be very traumatic for them. Okay, so, uh, so most of the patients, they get, within the time passage, they get better when they come to oh, counselling? Oh, yes, they do. Some, some of them need ongoing counselling um, because it's, you know, devastating that they haven't fallen pregnant again or they've done a frozen embryo transfer cycle. So that can also be devastating for them if it hasn't worked. Okay. They cry even when it has worked. Oh. <laughs> so, it's the same. <laughs> uh, Dr. John, uh, what sort of condition is azospermia basically? Well, azospermia technically means that when the man produces a sample of semen for us to analyse, there are absolutely no sperm whatsoever in that sample. So is, is azospermia connected with the age? Um, it's, 
the sperm count tends to decline with age, so it's not fair to say that men uh, don't have fertility issues in older years. But it's not, um, azospermia in itself generally isn't uh, age related. Most men who have start off with a good sperm count in their teens and early, early adulthood, they don't tend to go to azospermia as they get older. Um, no, azospermia tends to be caused by a um, very um, unique set of circumstances. Um, and essentially, it's either caused by um, a problem with the sperm coming, being allowed to get out of the testis where they're made, um, or it's because they're simply not being made. Um, so the, the, the factory's sh shut down, or the plumbing's wrong. Um, and they may be born with defective plumbing. Um, uh, there may be part of the tube missing that allows the sperm to reach the outside world. Or they, uh, they may have had an infection that's caused damage to the tube. Um, and then the other big group uh, is our, what, our gentlemen who, where sperm aren't being made. Some of those are related to genetics. Uh, about 10% um, probably have a genetic fault that's caused it. But there's also another huge group where we don't really know why. We, we, don't actually, we never get to the bottom of why they're not making sperm. Okay, so uh, are there certain uh, reasons or uh, like maybe particular reasons uh, which causes azospermia or there's no, there are no, not particular reasons? I'll ask you this question. That I would actually want the answer from you about this question, but I need to take a short break. We'll come back after a short break. Stay with us. Uh, yes, Dr. John. So um, what are the conditions of azospermia, like reasons basically? Okay, so the, the reasons uh, are that there may be that the man may have been born with part of the uh, tube missing that allows the sperm to reach the outside world. Uh, he may have uh, acquired a blockage through infection, or he may simply been, or he may have been born with a genetic defect that means he he doesn't make sperm. Uh, the genetic defect cannot be corrected. I'm afraid that is uh, that's what you've inherited, and you can't overcome that. But we do have very successful means for overcoming problems where either bits of tubes are missing or blocked. There are techniques that can be used to recover sperm because the sperm are still being made. They just simply uh, can't gain access to the outside world. Oh. There is also another small group. Uh, they do represent a small group of men who've got hormonal problems that can be managed quite successfully. Um, but they do only represent quite a small fraction of the uh, gentlemen who present with, uh, with azospermia. So is it curable? Curable, um, cure, cure in medical terms means you actually correct the underlying problem on a lifelong basis. We probably don't do that. We just get round the problem and we help them have a child if we can do that. If we can find sperm and, and get sperm, then we help them have a child. But we don't usually go back and cure the problem in, in a tri strict medical sense. Oh, okay. So it can be cured for a particular time. Means uh, you can just have an outcome, you can have a baby with that, but you cannot correct it completely. Correct. But how, how that for a particular time, when there, there are no sperms in... Well, in, in the suitable candidates, and it probably represents about 40 to 50% of the uh, men who initially present with azospermia, we can recover sperm directly from the testis. Um, oh, okay. But we can uh, ask what we call aspirate sperm. It's quite a minor procedure. And in, in successful cases, and in the right cases, we can get sperm 90 to 95% of the time. Um, and we can then store that sperm and use that as part of an IVF procedure with the gentleman's partner. Um, so eggs have to be recovered because we only get quite small numbers of sperm um, and but we can quite successfully then inject a sperm into an egg fertilize that egg and overall uh, those clients do very well indeed because it's a very discreet absolute problem that you've managed to overcome um, by finding sperm and creating embryos so the, the outcomes for those couples are amongst them the best we ever achieve Okay, Dr. Graham, uh, now there's a question which, uh, which is slightly uh, hilarious as well and confusing too. Earlier when these procedures came in Pakistan newly, so people had obviously a one serious concern which was 
whether it is haram or halal, whether like prescribed in our religion, we can do that, or it's it's not allowed in our religion. It was it was a sort of very difficult question for everyone. They thought that whether they should go for that procedure or not. And then coming on a lighter note, people also said that uh, uh, you don't have surety whether the sperms are of your partner or someone else. So was that some sort of thing which you had to face in Australia as well? Such, such questions? No, not, not the way you had to in Pakistan. And I believe that that's still a problem in Pakistan, that donated sperm is... But now uh, there are a lot of patients going on, they're having treatments, they're having babies like that. But earlier it was sort of taboo, you can say. Yes. But the question still re remains there, yes. We in Australia didn't have that same problem because I think that in Pakistan it was based mostly on religion. Yes. Um, and we don't have that problem. But, but not connecting with the religion part. First question was connecting with the religion. People had whether this is correct or wrong. But the second part, which if I do not connect it with religion, the authenticity, I would say. Like, what's the authenticity that the sperm is correctly of your partner? And then again, it goes indirectly uh, or directly, you can say, with the religion as well. So this is haram, you, whether you have no uh, you know, authenticity, whether that's of your partner or somebody else. I think what you're getting at uh, uh, is the way that we've evolved um, safe laboratory practice. Um, safe laboratory practice, we, we, yes. It, it's like nuts. somebody else is not exchanging these sperms. No, you, it's, it's a case of... Um, having, having procedures in place, and we have them in Australia and they're replicated here, um, where it's very simple things like making sure that you do not, don't have more than one sample of sperm actually on uh, working with one sample uh, more than one time. You also have things... So authenticity was like a, a first and serious concern in Concept Fertility oh, Centre. It's, it's always been a concern of laboratories and the standards have only increased over time. Um, as we become busier and more aware of the potential for harm that could be created. So there are now procedures in place, as I say, which, um, and it, it sounds simple, but it's actually very, it creates a real safety net. You make sure you only work with one sample at a time. There is what we call double checking, um, where um, two, uh, two laboratory staff have to confirm um, against independent paperwork that this is the sample from that person. Um, the same goes for embryos in the laboratory. You only work with one set of embryos at a time on a bench top. And there's, there's a constant audit and checking process going on. And we're also um, looking at introducing uh, an independent electronic assessment, uh, which I think if we do go down that route, we'll certainly be talking to Concept here about whether or not they want to follow on that one as well, where there's actually um, it's literally barcoding, um, tiny barcodes that go onto each and every dish and you check those and it's all computerized and you've got a full audit trail of everything that happens. Okay, but uh, you got the question now. But uh, still, again, there's, there's, there was a myth, you can say, that people said doctors trying to make their money. So in case if the infertility issue is 100%, they'll still say that you can be fertile and this is curable. So that's why they use other sperms and do, do that fraud. Did you face that such, no, such cases? No, and I, and I don't believe the premise is correct either. Um, I think that I still hope to believe that the medical fraternity are treating that couple the only way that's possible for that couple. If there's azoospermia and there's no correctable cause, then donor sperm is the only option, or childlessness, or adoption. Now, in Australia, adoption is increasingly difficult very difficult, either onshore or offshore. Um, being childless for us in, in an infertility clinic is not an option. We try to make sure that everyone that we can will get pregnant and ultimately have a live birth. Okay, great. So, um, plus, um what would you uh, tell to people who are facing this infertility issue? Um, what, what would you tell them, like, uh, should they visit fertility centers? And uh, what sort of patients should come indefinitely? <coughs> Traditionally, fertility has been defined as the lack of pregnancy over 12 months or, or 12 successful cycles. 
That has to be modified nowadays and, and taken the patient's age into account. And if a patient has not had a successful pregnancy and they're approaching a certain age where you know that the fertility is declining, then perhaps 12 cycles a year is, is not enough. Um, sorry, it's too much, too much time. Um, so I would suggest if patients are concerned that they haven't achieved a, a pregnancy, and what will influence them is the fact that all their friends have achieved a pregnancy and they haven't. And so th that will depend on their age group. And so I think that they should seek assistance. It doesn't mean going to somewhere like Concept straight away. They need to be channeled through their general practitioner, through their primary care physician first. And hopefully their primary care physician will see the problem, try to take care of as much of the problem that's within their sphere of expertise, and then uh, transfer the patient to a centre of excellence if they can't achieve success for the couple. Okay. Um, Liz, uh, you visited Cancer Fertility Center, Karachi branch, the branch which we are sitting right now here. Um, so are you satisfied with the standards? Oh, very much so. Um, it's very similar to how we run at home um, and everyone's um, care for the patients um, and the standards are just as good as what we have at home. So there isn't any um, issues. I've been to the laboratory, I've been into the theatre, um, I've been with coordination, so I've been all over the unit. I've been here for a week now, so there's, um, everything's running excellently. There's no problems at all. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. John, um, anything you want to uh, mention uh, for, uh, for people which are going through this infertility issue? You want to give them some message or you want to explain something to them, any, any procedure or any advice? Um, I think the, the, what I usually like to say to my clients is that um, they will face, they are likely to face failure at some point. Uh, an initial cycle uh, even in excellent clinics like ours and like uh, Concept Karachi, still more cycles fail than will work, at least at the first attempt. However, what's important to know is that there are a lot of studies, many, many studies, that show that if they keep trying, in most cases, pregnancy will, or stands a much better, will happen. It's, and that an individual failure is, is not the end of the road and that, that they shouldn't be... Um, despondent or, or destroyed because one attempt doesn't work. It, this is a, a long-term process and they need to work with us, um, all of us in the uh, fertility world, uh, nurses, embryologists, clinicians, they need to work with us and understand that and we can then help them. Okay, and uh, your message for people which are hopeless, almost hopeless. It's never hopeless. Never, never stay hopeless? No, never say never. Okay, great. Never say never. That's amazing. And um, what, uh, uh, the same uh, question uh, which I ask uh, you, like uh, what things you want here uh, in this fertility center, like you believe uh, in this fertility center they don't have it. They should also bring that stuff here, like any technology, anything. The thing that, that is probably a, a, a stumbling block for Karachi is the cost of the treatment. Again, because that question stays. Like, a lot of people believe that it's, it's very expensive treatment. And unfortunately, you don't have any government input into the costs. We are in a happy position in Australia that the government does have some input into the costs. And at Concept in Australia, we have fairly recently tried to reduce the cost to the patient. And that's part of the, the aims of, of Concept Australia. I don't know the easy answer for Karachi and for Lahore and Islamabad and, and the other concepts here. Um, Karachi is the city, by the way. People of uh, Karachi face high inflation across Pakistan. Uh, so I don't know. I, I don't think... The, it's the ability to influence the government to start pouring more money in it hmm. because I don't think the government has that much money. 
Oh, okay. Not an easy answer, I'm afraid. Yeah, unfortunately, the previous corrupts have eaten up us much. They made their own properties and their own stuff, and they just. I'm not going to inflame the, the situation by commenting on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, okay, uh, Liz. Uh, as uh, I, I just want to conclude it, and would ask the same uh, conclusion uh, from John as well. Like, uh, is that uh, concern in Australia as well in Pakistan? It's it's a high concern that it's a very expensive treatment. So in Australia, it is a as very well? expensive treatment. Um, we have just offered something to help people make like a bulk billing thing, but we have government subsidy, which makes it easier. I think the reason why it's so expensive for here is that the drugs that we buy for private patients in Australia is very expensive. And if you can get your drug reps to cut those prices down, that's where a lot of your costs are. Whereas our patients in Australia can get it under script um, because they're allowed through the um, Artificial Reproductive Technology Act. Um, as a patient here, you have to pay full price for that drug and that is very expensive. Uh, so Dr. John, uh, apart from the government subsidy, uh, do you have any charitable organizations also contributing for uh, fraternity uh, of uh, fertility? Uh, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, obviously, um, a lot of our clients do have uh, health fund insurance, uh, which if they've got the right level of insurance will significantly contribute towards their costs. This is in, Aus in Australia. Um, but I'm not aware of any charitable groups that, uh, certainly not in Australia, I don't know whether you have here, that will assist with that. I think it's possibly regarded as still being a little bit taboo for that kind of thing, a little bit of uh, something that they wouldn't want to have their, themselves associated with. But I would agree, I think accessibility, to use a general term, is one of the key things from removing a lot of the stigma for couples and the, the, the more easier it is to access treatment both financially and physically then uh, then i think you know we've really arrived as far as the ivf world is concerned okay great thank you so much dr john dr graham thompson and liz uh, thank you for participating in uh, my program and uh, i hope a lot of misconceptions of the viewers must be cleared bahut sari baatein jo jo concerns aapke honge infertility ke hawale se ummeed hai ki wo clear hue honge jis tarah kuch conditions hoti hain ye ek myth hai ki sirf auraton ka masla hota hai infertile hona ya bachcha na hona sirf aurat ka masla hai infertility mard mein bhi ho sakti hai aur aurat mein bhi ho sakti hai lekin कुछ जो हमने आज के प्रोग्राम में जाना उसमें यह है कि औरत की उम्र वाकई थोड़ी इन्फ्लुएंस करती है क्योंकि औरत को अपने वोम में बच्चा कैरी करना होता है इसीलिए औरत की उम्र मैटर करती है जबकि मर्द जो है उसकी फर्टिलिटी ज़रा उम्र उसकी ज़रा लंबी उम्र होती है तब वो उसकी ज़रा कम होती है लेकिन ये मसला दोनों में होता है साथ ही साथ लाइफ स्टाइल भी जो है बहुत ज़्यादा मैटर करता है आपकी हेल्दी लाइफ स्टाइल होता है तो फिर आपकी फर्टिलिटी के इश्यूज़ का मसला भी एड्रेस होता है लेकिन ये कोई होपलेस होने वाली बात नहीं है अगर आप ये फेस करें आपका बच्चा नहीं है तो आप कौन से फर्टिलिटी सेंटर आएँ या डिफरेंट फर्टिलिटी सेंटर्स में आएँ यहाँ पर कराची में हाई स्टैंडर्ड्स के मौजूद हैं पाकिस्तान में मज़ीद शहरों में भी मौजूद हैं यहाँ पर आप अपना मसला जो है वो बयान कर सकते हैं और जो भी आपका मसला है वो उसको क्योर किया जा सकता है तो ये कोई अनक्योरेबल और कोई खतरनाक बीमारी नहीं है एक सर्टन कंडीशन है जो कि किसी भी इंसान के साथ हो सकती है आज के लिए इतना ही अल्लाह हाफ गॉड ब्लेस यू ऑल